thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Jacob Smith. Uh, I'm here representing um, an awesome uh, company based in Michigan called Altimetric, um, which is a digital transformation company that helps uh, basically help clients stay ahead of the curve with technology change, um, digital transformation, just uh, keep keeping up with that ever changing uh, world, helping people innovate. Um, so yeah, what we uh, we've been working with Kevin uh, for um, man, we've we've probably been doing this for for over a year now, uh, okay. partnering together. Um, so what we do, uh, myself and, and Ryan Robinson, who's uh, wearing a cool jacket somewhere on your screen here, uh, we help technical professionals connect and grow and and work on exciting things um, through a project called Collider. Um, and so we're excited to be here. Uh, supporting uh, Kevin and the Medical API um, meetup. And we're very, very excited uh, today to be talking about deconstructing a smart fire uh, app and, and learning how to um, use this technology to, to, build, um, to, to, to build something exciting. Uh, and so um, it sounds like some of you already know Kevin, uh, but Kevin Malloy uh, is notably an MD, uh, a practicing physician, as well as a software engineer who has extensive experience uh, with um, developing interoperable health products, uh, and particularly with uh, just the, the emerging uh, fire, the potential with, with fire, um, and all the exciting things you can do with, with API uh, to tap into uh, health records and all sorts of other things. Um, so he's, uh, he, he knows his stuff. Uh, I'm excited to, to learn from him as well today. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin. Great. Thanks, Jacob and Ryan. And thanks for uh, sponsoring the event. Um, and um, the way I kind of organize this today is on, um, if you are just joining, the way I organize this today is on uh, something called Notion, which is kind of like Evernote, except you can like publish it as a web page. So if you go to uh, notion.patient.dev, you should be able to see the whole talk. Um, it'll be there uh, for you know a long time. Um, what what I included on there is um, Notion has this way of embedding forms in it. So this is just a Google form, and if you want to um, kind of have the mic for a couple of minutes, and you know maybe you're working on something, maybe um, you want to tell people about what you're working on, or you're trying to find other people like you. Um, if you put your info in this Google form, what will happen is this Google sheet here um, will keep track of that and um, update itself. And it's just me and Jacob currently, um, which is fine. So what we're going to uh, look at today um, is three different apps in the next like 30 minutes. It'll go pretty quick. Um, so we're going to look at something called the growth chart app and kind of look at um, an approach to, you know, if you were here like, oh, I want to make a growth chart app, what would I do? Um, this is kind of a primer to help you do that and kind of think through that. So we're going to look at growth chart, which is an old app, but a good app. There's something called Wellsheet, which is, uh, I, I really like what they're trying to do. Um, and they're on Epic's app store, so I thought they'd be interesting to look at. And there's a, um, an app called One Record, which is a pure patient facing app. Um, I don't have any like stake or I don't get sponsored or like I'm not sponsored by any of these people. I'm not sponsored by Altimetric. I just kind of organize these meetups to kind of um, help people think through problems and um, figure out like the way to create really cool apps on top of Fire. So I don't have any relation with these people. So I made a little sheet. Uh, there's a Google Doc link here um, about some of the things I think of, like um, when somebody tells me about their uh, idea for making an app. Um, it's somewhat simplistic, um, intentionally so. Um, it has just five things at the top, and then there's a few rows here. So I left the top row open for your idea, so you could like print this out and kind of fill it out. Um, as, as we go along. I also have an entry for the growth chart for Wellsheet and for one record. Um, if you have to leave before the end of this talk, the key is actually at the end of this notion um, all the way at the bottom. So the things I think about are like, who is this app for, 
right? What change is it trying to make? How do you enroll a patient in this app? What fire data that's USCDI could you use? And what other data do you need to make this work, right? Um, and below I go through one by one, uh, kind of what I mean. So it, it's really good to be very intentional about who the app is for. Um, so, you know, you can have apps that are for providers, you can have apps that are for patients, um, and you can have apps that are like for insurers, researchers, public health people, kind of this back end access stuff. Um, what I mean by providers is, um, so for uh, Freckle, you know, the provider is a nutritionist, right? But there's also a patient and what you're seeking to do is to have that nutritionist with a provider, a provider user who's the nutritionist create this meal plan and then get it out to that other uh, user who's a patient, right? Um, so sometimes there's a combination, like you're, you're doing a few different users. In Fire, all the apps are like scoped to either a provider, a patient, or kind of a, um, a backend access, which is kind of like a headless, a server talking to another server type thing. Um, so in Freckle's case, you know, if you have a nutritionist and a patient, you may need two apps. Uh, you may need to register two apps to actually pull off what you're trying to pull off. Um, when you think about users too, it's good to think about if, if they're a provider, if their workflow is already inside of the electronic health record, like um, Arista MD, um, from what it sounded like, they were what would happen is that provider would go into Epic's hyperspace, they would open a patient, and then they would go to the Arista MD um, app, and then they would click on something, right? And do something in Arista MD to kind of uh, request this consult. So that would be an yeah. example of like... <laughs> not, not to interrupt, but this, sure. is, this is a perfect question because embedding it in the EHR, yep. very challenging, lots of work, workflow constraints, variations, yep. that sort of a thing. Yep. So if you're building something for providers, get ready. <laughs> yeah, I will say like um, if you're, so if you're embedded in EHR, like you're going to have to, you know, talk to a health system or, and like the EHR company most likely, right? Um, whereas, you know, if it's just a patient facing app that's solely just for patients, um, odds are in, in Epic, you could do it rather easily. And that's why I'm going over one record. Um, at the end, um, but I, I completely agree. You know, if you're trying to embed something in the EHR, not only are there constraints on like real estate inside of the screen, but also like um, getting a BAA with the health system and like, you know, going through some kind of security review and all that type of stuff. Um, but when you're, you know, if you, if you have an idea for an app, you know, one good place to start is to be very specific about who it's for, provider, patient, uh, kind of headless user, where it's actually surfacing. So providers, if it's embedded in the EHR, if it's like something that's going on a mobile phone that's outside of the EHR, um, if it's a patient, if it's within the patient portal, like the um, freckle thing, it may be that you want to surface that within the patient portal, right? That a patient logs into the patient portal at that health system and is able to access freckle. Or it may be that a patient just um, goes to a random website and puts in their patient portal username password and standalone launches this and it's not associated with the patient portal other than the username password. Um, there's another variety of app which is like proxies are trying to do something. Um, so an example of proxy access would be like a mother father has access to their kids chart right for maybe immunizations or whatnot. Um, so there's ways of doing proxy access to give uh, to get access to a user who's not actually that patient, right? And there's also uh, insurers, researchers, public health, this backend access, but I'm not really going to cover B2B or backend access um, right now. It looked like there was a comment in the um, in the chat there, but it's right behind my video, so I can't quite see it. Um, so Sam was asking if anyone's Good. working direct messaging rather than creating custom Epic Cerner apps. Um, I, I have not. I've, uh, I've certainly done a ton of research um, 
you probably don't want to use direct messaging for Epic because they have an API endpoint that enables you to send messages directly to in baskets, uh, which is your, you know, the term for inboxes and in, in Epic. Uh, with Cerner, um, you're going to have to use direct messaging <laughs> uh, because they don't have such an endpoint to my knowledge. Uh, so hopefully that helps. But uh, some of the hitches you're going to run into along the way will be variations in EHRs with regard to what their capabilities are, patient matching, um, the format of the CCD that you would attach. Um, so there's lots of variations in the implementation of direct messaging across various EHRs. Even within the uh, Epic system, depending on which hospital um, implements it? Um, I don't know about Epic because we just simply didn't need to use um, direct messaging with Epic. Um, I do know that not all instances of Epic um, support direct messaging as a standard. Whereas if you go with Cerner or Athena Health, um, they very readily use direct messaging, I think as, as a standard for interoperability and transition to patient care. I, I could be wrong, take, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, it's probably data that's about a year old. Yeah, because my understanding was, you know, every EMR, every Epic that's ONC certified now has to have drug messaging, but they don't necessarily turn it on nope. in-house. Yeah, I don't think that that's up to date, that information. Hmm. Um, I think that the ONC backed off of direct messaging as their interoperability, you know, you know, the, the thing that they wanted to use for that um, back a few years ago. So I, I know that that was the case. I don't know that it still is the case. Sorry, Kevin, didn't mean to. Uh, oh, yeah. Sam, <laughs> Sam, you should have uh, spoke up on the Google form because you're doing uh, some interesting stuff with uh, scheduling. Yeah, I'm sorry. I jumped in late. So um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, give a brief overview, um, whatever, whenever you find it uh, easy, Kevin. OK, but let's do it at the end. I think. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, there were a few other uh, comments in the chat, and Ben was wondering, does anyone have experience getting access to inpatient data, like progress notes, labs, scheduled meds via fire? Is there a general consensus that EMR providers will need to enable access to inpatient data, just like outpatient data from cures? Um, I believe, uh, in, uh, is it Chris who was speaking from Arista MD, or it used to be at Arista MD? Was that you, Chris? Uh, no, this is Nick. Nick. Um, yes. You, you may know better than myself, but uh, my impression is it doesn't matter if it's inpatient or outpatient, um, but all the data um, should be available regardless if it's inpatient or outpatient. Yeah, as far as I know, that's the case. The only constraint is just having access to those endpoints. Um, mm -hmm. And you just work with work through Epic to get certified for that. And of course, when you actually implement, you'll have to work with your partners there. Unless you're like a patient facing app purely. Yes, yep. for sure, yep. Um, and Elizabeth Sprouse uh, was wondering whether data would be inpatient or outpatient would would be mainly what type oh, of- Oh, I was just is? answering. I was responding that it- Oh, oh okay. <laughs> it's really, yeah, it would just be based on the type of encounter, it would be the same fire resource um, in whatever LOINC code you had then matched on the provider side to that document type, like your progress notes. Um, but it's, it's not, yes, correct. You can get to either inpatient or ambulatory. Gotcha. And Ben was saying, oh, I'm referring to patient facing app. So patients, the, the idea behind uh, cures is patients aren't restricted. I would say I'm an answer to your question, Ben. Um, that's the, uh, my, the spirit of cures as I understand it. Um, well, thanks for the questions. That was some good conversation. Um, I'll keep going forward on this um, at just one approach to building, uh, to deconstructing medical apps. So we did, um, who's it for? Um, and what change is it seeking to make? Um, this uh, I think is sometimes uh, missed to a certain extent um, as 
And I think it has implications as to what data you're recording in terms of what do you what are you hoping your app will do? Um, how are you going to monitor that's actually doing that, right? So what are some common changes um, these apps are trying to make? One is to take an action, right? Like to a medication reminder app type thing um, where a patient would get their medication data, say I'm taking these meds and then would get reminders, right? Sometimes the changes uh, to manage something better, like to adhere to clinical guidelines or a certain uh, workflow that a health system wants a provider to do. Uh, sometimes it's to change behavior, educate, you know, like discharge instructions, diagnoses, medication, meals, meal planning, kind of behavior change stuff. Um, most of the time, I feel like it's uh, uh, kind of this uh, Radiohead's OK Computer song, the fitter, happier, like I'm dating myself of when I went to high school. But this was, you know, Radiohead was kind of big around that time. And if you've ever listened to this song, it's like, we want to be fitter, happier, more productive, and, you know, not eating too much. And a lot of these, um, at least ads for these different apps kind of read that way to me. Um, but that is a uh, uh, kind of my opinion. And George likes the song as well. Um, it is kind of dated though, I realize. Um, so if we go to the third column here, how do you enroll a patient? Um, so I got to thinking about this. I was reading this um, post by uh, Redox. Um, and if you're doing EHR integration, you should um, take a look at Redox. Um, they do a lot of it. Um, they do non-fire as well as fire integrations. And at this link, they were talking about how to design products for EHR integrations. And they mentioned like, how are you gonna enroll a patient? Um, like, how do you know, how do you launch your app when it's needed? How do you know who needs it? And they broke it into three things. Uh, one of them was like, there's something that happens in the system, like a patient gets discharged and then they have this, they're supposed to use this app after they get discharged. And you can kind of hook into this thing called the ADT feed, which is admit discharge transfer feed, which um, is not fire. It's just this HL, old HL7 message thing where you would basically hire somebody like Redox and it would help you integrate with these messages. And every time a patient got discharged, you would get notified, essentially. Um, then there's also like a provider-initiated enrollment where um, the kind of in the Arista MD scenario, uh, a doctor would be inside of hyperspace and Epic. They would open Arista MD. They would click a button, and that would enroll the patient in this consult platform, right? Um, there's also patient-initiated, which is um, you know, a patient goes and finds Apple Health on the um, App Store, they download it and they, um, they start using it. So it's initiated by them. Um, the one thing with patient initiated stuff that I've seen is, and why I put SpongeBob SquarePants here drinking a coffee all by himself, is, you know, sometimes it's hard. You, you build this great thing and you're like, please, somebody come use it, right? You know, it can be kind of lonely. Um, and the question is going to be, like how do people know that your um, patient-facing app even exists, right? Um, if the patient has to initiate an interaction with it. Um, the one thing Redox didn't mention was um, kind of this employer patient initiated um, workflow that I kind of see, which is if you're following a lot of um, digital therapeutics like Hinge Health, so Hinge, um, will contract with employers to offer their apps as a benefit to their employees. Like they'll go to like uh, FedEx and say, hey, we have this great physical therapy app. Um, could you tell your employees about it? And we'll um, you know, charge it this much if your employees use it, um, that type of thing. Um, so that would be kind of like an employer advertising your patient initiated app uh, for you. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any comments on enrolling patients um, in using their app. Um, I'll let you chime in. I don't know if you have any, um, Nick or Elizabeth. I have, I have one kind of like inside secret for you a little bit. So okay. <laughs> um, 
I help support the FIRE program at Emory Healthcare in Atlanta. And when it comes to patient requested apps, I mean, we're going to be fully in compliance, we are today fully in compliance with 21st Century Cures Act and no information blocking, although the deadline's April. Um, We really look for patients to make the request to connect for those consumer apps. And so for the consumer apps we have connected to, um, like Huddle Health and One Record, I think our, I think the patients, like, I think that they found patients to make the request to us. And so, you know, that's just like yeah. a little bit of an inside scoop for you guys as you're, if you're starting to try to get traction to connect with healthcare organizations is to really um, find folks to make those requests because come April, those will have to be facilitated. Yep. It's, uh, yeah, it's what you're saying is the independent app developer reached out to you and said, or their patient, they got a patient to reach out to you being like, hey, I want to connect Huddle, right? Yep, yep, (laughs) exactly. Um, All right. So the other part of um, this little sheet I put together um, is, is there USCDI data from FHIR? And then is there other data you need? Um, The reason um, I say USCDI data from FHIR So USCDI is the US uh, core data for interoperability. Basically, it's the stuff that is kind of in the free tier for exchange um, until probably like 2022, 2023. Um, Essentially, if you build something that just uses USCDI data, um, you will probably have less cost associated with it and kind of less trials and tribulations. Um, If you're interested in what USCDI data encompasses, um, I put a link to the ONC, to the um, government regulator who deals with this right there. Um, Suffice to say, you can get like vital signs, you can get lab tests, you get device information, you can get some clinical documents, you can get allergies, conditions, procedures, patient demographics, immunizations. Um, There's probably a few other I'm missing um, there, but I encourage you to check out um, this USCDI website that the government hosts about what data needs to be able to be exchanged until about 2022. Um, if you're making a patient app in Epic and you use just USCDI data, when you go and register it, it'll say, it'll have a little green light that says this data will um, auto um, be auto enabled at the different Epic clients. It's a little green button at the bottom of the screen. And in a previous meetup, we had kind of gone over registering an app. Um, but if you just use USCDI, it kind of can propagate out on its own. Um, whereas if you're using stuff that's not USCDI, um, then it won't auto propagate to Epic clients. Um, and then I put this uh, column of other stuff, which is just like, you know, other considerations are kind of a catch-all. Like you may want stuff that's non-US CDI, but available in say Epic, like Epic's Fire has a list resource, which is like, um, you know, a list of patients for Dr. X. Like US CDI doesn't require um, this to be available or to be uh, free to patients. Um, So you may end up needing a list API so that the provider can actually find the patient that is you're trying to enroll in your system. Um, sometimes uh, it may be that you need a schedule of like appointments for a provider so you can enroll a patient in your app. Um, appointment is not part of USCDI, so you may be um, kind of in a different... Um, Let's see how many device. What's um, Other stuff to consider is like, do you need to write stuff back to the EHR, like a clinical document? That probably has implications. Um, if you're trying to track usage, you may need or you're trying to store custom data that's not in Fire or any of the App Orchard APIs, you may need to store it on your own instance, like AWS Fireworks, Azure, Google Cloud, et cetera. Um, So you may need a mechanism for capturing other data to measure the change you're trying to make. Um, I'll pause there for a second, and then we'll kind of jump into the three apps well, now we get to jump into the real world and <laughs> kind of fire use. Um, so the first app I have on the uh, sheet there um, below your idea is the growth chart app. 
and it was put out by Boston Children's. It's kind of like the iconic Fire app. It's like one of the first ones that was ever put out there. Um, it's in the Smart Health IT App Store. So if you click on that link, it'll go to a, um, a website that looks like this. Um, essentially, it was developed from a collaboration with uh, Boston Children's, Fjord, Interopion, um, and some clinicians. And the app, the change it's trying to make is it demonstrates a high performance, concise, minimal click presentation of a child's growth over time. Um, so this is a picture of it. It's a provider. So the, who is it for? It's for clinicians. And it would be embedded within an electronic health record, right? So you would open up the EHR, you would pick a patient, and then this would pop up, right? The change it's trying to make, the best I can tell, is it wants to demonstrate fire. So it wants to be like, wow, fire can do this great thing. And that was because this was one of the first apps that um, came along. Um, but it also wants to be a high performance, concise, minimal click presentation of a child's growth over time, right? Um, so what that means to me is you're gonna need some way of measuring what high performance and minimal click is, right? So kind of at the um, far end of the table where there's other data, you know, if you're trying to measure that, hey, you know, the load time on this was super fast, which I guess is high performance, or, you know, a user when they logged in only made so many clicks, it made this many clicks, um, that would be stuff to store in the other data that so at the at the end of the table there, that you're not going to be able to store in Fire or any kind of um, any kind of place inside of the EHR itself, right? And that's why I think um, thinking about the change you're trying to make has implications for how you're going to store data and kind of architect stuff. Uh, for the third uh, column, um, how do you enroll a patient? Well, in this case, to enroll a patient to use the growth chart app, um, you basically just open it in the EHR. Um, and what USCDI data do you need from FHIR? Well, it's a child's growth over time. So you're gonna need uh, weight and height, which come from observation. So if we go to here, um, what data we're gonna need from the USCDI is patient information. So up there, there is a patient name and a date of birth and an age. So that's available from the patient resource. And then from the observation resource, you're gonna get um, the uh, height and the weight, and I think they get gestational age and stuff like that uh, for really premature um, kiddos. Um, so if you went to epics, um, kind of fire.epic.com and you're trying to make this app, what would that look like? Well, you would go in and you'd create a, an account and you'd go to create an app. You would give it a name like growth chart app. You would click, it's for clinicians, right? That was our user. And the APIs you would need are observation search, which core characteristics, which I believe is height and weight, and then patient read. And then you need like a redirect. Um, that's kind of a like simplistic way of thinking about like how did they make this in Fire? They made it by using a provider scoped app that uses patient resource as well as observation. Um, to get a better idea of what it actually looks like, if you're interested, um, you can copy this, go to launch.smarthealthit. Um, this is a little app launcher that they put together, and it lets you launch different types of apps, like a provider EHR launch. So the provider opens up the app inside the EHR, a patient portal launch. So it simulates a patient opening the app in a patient portal a provider standalone launch, so they open it directly, like from a mobile phone, or a patient standalone launch, which is like a patient on their personal computer at home, right? To use this, all you would need to do, to use this for the growth chart app, all you need to do is do a provider EHR launch, enter in this here, which happens to be their launch URL, and launch the app. Um, they make you pick a, a patient, which will use Theo and Theo is six. And here it has inside of this simulated EHR here with a little sidebar, it has graphed out the height and the weight. And then it did some BMI stuff. All right. 
So I hope that kind of gives like a, just a general overview of if you're trying to um, think through creating an app that's embedded inside of the EHR um, in a really simple way. Um, so for the non-fire, we went over to non-fire stuff, which was like minimal clicks and usage. There's a, another app out there called Wellsheet. Um, it's interesting because it's just trying to make a dent in reducing physician burnout and improving patient, patient care. It's kind of like one of those okay computer things to me, um, which you kind of read a lot. Um, if you want to look at it, it's app, actually in App Orchard, in Epic's App Orchard here. It says that they enhance the provider experience by making clinical workflows more intuitive, specific to clinical specialty and actionable. Um, they have some images here and it looks like they have some patient demographics, right? It looks like they're doing something, COPD, UTI, wound infection, skin infection, sepsis. So those look like they're kind of doing like conditions to me. And then they're bringing up some calculator here, right? Um, which it must be custom to them. Um, they also have a storyline where it looks like they have uh, vital signs, like a respiratory rate and a pulse ox. And they have like some labs, like a CRP and a white blood cell count. And it looks like you can do this, if you're a provider, you can do this on a mobile device or embedded inside of the EHR is kind of the same UI we saw when we launched the, um, the growth chart there. Um, I believe you can link to their site a little more. I know that it's broken a little from App Orchard for some reason. Um, but again, we can see that, hey, there's this embedded app for providers, COPD, heart rate, meds, a medication, albuterol, some observations. Um, it apparently gives you the right patient data at the right time, it displays data and smart notifications based on your specialty and preference. So somehow this is gonna notify you that something happened apparently. Um, we saw some of this with the calculator and an FEV1. And then they apparently have some way of handing off across your team member smoothly, uh, smooth, safe transitions of care with shareable notes and task management. Um, which probably has a whole layer of complexity to it. So if we go down here, um, COPD is a condition, so that would be condition resource, heart rate would be an observation, uh, medication request, I missed it, I said statement here, but it's medication request would give you the medications the patient's on. Um, the interesting thing about the um, the notifications is there, there's really no good way in fire there may be an app orchard and maybe nick could speak a little to this um, to get notifications that like a lab such as a cbc came back um, you could imagine trying to do that with like a server talking to the server periodically and being like hey is there anything new on this patient is there anything new on this patient and, like doing that every five minutes to simulate it um, but that might be something that kind of complicates the implementation of this is these notifications. Um, and likewise, this uh, handoff across teams with the shareable notes, that's probably custom. Like it, it would be hard to imagine how just using pure fire, you would create um, these shareable tasks. Um, it just doesn't seem like they're available, at least in Epic's fire currently. You could create like a note, like a clinical note, but I don't think that's what they're getting after like a H and P or a progress note. It looks like they're more after um, these ta uh, managing different tasks. Um, oh yeah, and somehow they coordinate cross-platform. They get the other HIE, other EHRs, HIEs and claim stuff to come in, which is probably done within Epic itself, um, more so than kind of any of the APIs. Um, so if we go up to the sheet here, and we look for Wellsheet. So who's it for? It's clearly for clinicians, right? Um, it's inside the EHR, so it has like an EHR launch. It also has like some mobile component, which would be a standalone launch. Um, and it may need like a backend account for like notifications um, if you were doing that. 
uh, what change is it trying to do? It said it was trying to make um, physicians more efficient, uh, have a better provider experience and less burnout. Um, how do you enroll patients? Um, one way that was very obvious is when you were um, uh, looking at their website is you would go inside the EHR right here and you would click on the patient and open up the app. Um, how you would enroll it, enroll a patient in it, like if uh, on a mobile device where you, you're not necessarily already associated with a patient, you may need something such as Epic's List API, which like will list the patients for you. That is not like part of USCDI though, and probably would um, be, be more costly um, to implement. And the task management, um, I don't know how you enroll the different patients in that, um, but uh, um, that, that's kind of, that was kind of outstanding on me. Um, for USCDI data and fire, what do you need? You need condition for like COPD and all that stuff, observation for the uh, vital signs, medication requests for the medication um, stuff. Um, and um, if you were creating a document, then DocRef. So how would this look when you went to register in Epic? You would go create an app. It would be like well sheet -ish app. It would be for clinicians and your APIs would be the ones we talked about, patient read, condition search, medication request, uh, observation search for labs and observation search for vitals. Um, if you were trying to do that backend app, you would probably click backend systems and I imagine you would be searching for new labs and new vitals. Other data to think about is like you may need a list of patients for the mobile um, standalone launch. You probably need somewhere to store these practice patterns. They talked about mapping users to actions and kind of saving that for later and computing these scores, which may not be savable. Um, you know, for the um, what you're trying to do, which was like to increase uh, efficiency, you may need to get like length of stay um, from like some extracts that wouldn't readily be available in Fire. You know, like if, if, if you're saying you're going to um, increase efficiency, you probably want some metric for that, which isn't going to be readily available. Um, and we talked about the tasks. Um, uh, and I'll just quickly go over one record to kind of finish it out since we kind of ran a little short on time. Um, but one record is kind of just my synopsis of it is, is just kind of beautiful to, to see. Um, it's a pure patient facing app. It's at onerecord.com. And it says that it collects all your medical records in one place, um, wherever you've received care in the last five years. And you can search by hospital or doctor's practice. Um, it apparently has a provider integration and a payer integration, um, but I was just focusing on patients. So it says uh, your life, build one consolidated medical record for your full health history that includes test results, immunizations, and more. So over here, you see there's allergies, conditions, family history, immunizations, labs, meds, some of the similar stuff um, as to uh, well sheet there. And it lets you manage your whole family in one place and this uses proxy access, um, which lets like a parent, a parent access their kids medical records up to a certain age. Um, so if we go here um, on the notion, I kind of mapped out some of this. So for allergies, it would be the allergy intolerance resource. Clinical vitals would be observation. Conditions would be condition. Um, heart rate would be observation. This lab here would be observation. I think it's a CRP. Apparently there's like an aspirin allergy here, which would be allergy intolerance. There's this interesting appointment, which is um, there is an appointment resource, but it's non-USCDI, which may complicate um, this uh, patient-facing app so much uh, to, to an extent because you wouldn't be able to like auto-register it. Um, but that is uh, kind of the resources you would need. So if you were to create this inside of the epic, uh, epic fire.epic.com, you'd give it a name like one record-ish app. Um, you would say, oh, it's for patients. 
I want patient.read, which would let me know the patient's name and date of birth, their conditions, their medications, observations, labs, vitals, and allergies, right? Um, for other data, you would probably need is like appointments if you really needed that, but that probably won't auto register or auto propagate for a patient app inside of Epic. Um, you know, how you're going to keep track of how many EHRs per user are connected, you probably need to roll your own thing, kind of um, keeping track of at least how many are connected. And if you have um, kind of a, a long lived way of connecting to them, you need to store those credentials somewhere. So it's not like you could store this all in some EHR somewhere. Um, and I'm not sure their business model. Um, there is a key I put together if you were interested in it. And oh gosh, you know, I'll update it. It only did part of it. That's weird. Um, and at the bottom, I have some other resources um, about like where the host stuff, um, but in terms of time, we're kind of at time. So I'll stop there. Hey, thanks everyone for attending. Oh, and Ryan has one more thing. Yes, forgive me, uh, everyone. Really quickly, if you all don't mind, can you please take a moment and fill out our post-event survey? Take care. Good seeing y'all.